చేయని Okay, good morning friends. As you know, uh, this is the time allotted for your elective, one of your electives. Now today I am going to deal with uh, the crop production elective. So all the participants who have opted for crop production may join this. as you know so that there are two blocks under this block one deals with uh, soil soil fertility tillage and weed control etc and the block two deals with what we call crop production so in the first block generally we study about uh, what are soils and what is uh, the climatic conditions and uh, what is what are the various uh, agricultural practices that we undertake such as tillage different types of tillages different implements that are being used to do tillage practices and we also study about uh, the manures fertilizers the weeds weed control and the cropping patterns under block 1 so under the block 2 we study about uh, uh, the methods of cultivation and the land preparation and uh, harvesting storage etc and also what are the common pests and diseases you encounter with regards to rice wheat maize sorghum bajra ragi these are uh, uh, your cereals and uh, millets and we also have uh, <clears throat> various pulses such as uh, groundnut uh, we have you know oil seeds such as castor sesame sunflower sunflower and uh, pulses such as black gram green gram red gram bengal gram 
we have cash crops such as cotton tobacco we also have uh, you know cotton and uh, spices such as chili turmeric ginger coriander etc and we have certain orchards such as mango citrus cashew nut and coconut so this is broadly these are topics that you are supposed to know and you will be asked in examination so uh, we now i have chosen i have divided all the topics that are being uh, included in our syllabus into you know six the categories are blocks sub blocks as such so in each class generally see a in all we have roughly 18 units or so in each class we will try to learn about three units so we have six classes allotted for us and in that six classes we will try to complete the uh, 18 odd sub units or units in today's class we learn about what is the meaning of agricultural meteorology what are different soils and what are manures and fertilizers so this is the thing the, the this we'll try to learn in today's you know class now to begin with agriculture meteorology so agriculture meteorology that is the weather and the climatic conditions that determine your uh, crop yield or crop productivity will study so in agriculture meteorology you know we have uh, you know climate and weather i think you know the meaning of uh, climate and uh, weather generally uh, the climate or climatology deals with what we call longer period of time in a given larger area of in a large geographical area what are the climatic conditions that are prevalent or average climatic conditions of a, a broader area the study of these conditions we call climatology or uh, you know <clears throat> climatic conditions or atmospheric conditions see for example uh, the climate of a country the climate of a state climate of a country continent indian climate or climate of andhra pradesh or climate of telangana as such so here larger area various climatic conditions various weather conditions that are prevalent in a larger area tell you about uh, uh, the atmospheric conditions or climatic conditions of that area so now opposite to this is what we call weather weather tells you about uh, the small area that is weather of hyderabad weather of mumbai weather of vizag a small area that is uh, whether it is going to be uh, what we call a cloudy or a rainy and what could be the maximum and minimum temperatures as such so generally um, you know um, while uh, uh, forecasting about uh, uh, you know if uh, a match is there for example if uh, a cricket is being played so how weather could be in tomorrow's weather conditions that means in that particular town how the climatic conditions likely to prevail that gives you what we call you know weather conditions so now the agricultural meteorology meteorology means what are the weather condition or what are the climatic conditions that determine that influence the crop yield so under this in our syllabus we study about uh, the light or the solar radiation we learn learn about uh, the solar radiation then we'll study about the temperature we'll study about the pressure we we'll study about the wind movement we we'll study about the humidity and the effects of uh, evaporation and transpiration 
and the clouds and the types of rains etc so in today in now in the first part in the first 15 minutes we we'll learn about uh, the solar radiation the temperature wind the relative humidity then uh, the rain rainfall types of rains and how you know light temperature pressure humidity rain effect the crop yield of a, a particular area so now to begin with you know solar radiation or uh, you know in this so radiation as you know it is nothing but electromagnetic waves that come from sun and ultimately reach earth you will be surprised you know only 50 or roughly 50% of the solar radiation that earth receives utilizes and the rest of the 50% is reflected back into the space now this light that touches the earth you know it raises the temperature because atmosphere absorbs this radiation and thereby it gets hot up and uh, even uh, you know earth surface also receives sunlight it also hots up now this hot up conditions uh, they in turn heat or pass you know heat or temperature to the wind and uh, thereby wind moves up because it becomes light and moves up now this causes what we call variation in temperature and also variation in pressure now coming to the light you know we study about uh, the effect of light in three or four parameters that is the type of the light the quality of the light duration of the light these have a profound effect on the crop yield now this light you know you no know, light if no light no life because the energy that is there in the light is being absorbed by chlorophyll pigment and does what we call photosynthesis now photosynthesis is nothing but what conversion of light energy into chemical energy conversion of light energy into chemical energy is what we call photosynthesis now this nature of the light you know you know vip gr violet indigo blue red etc you know seven you know colors rainbow colors although seven colors are there all are not that efficient plants you know have different pigments chlorophyll xanthophyll carotenoids etc each are you know effective in absorbing a given you know wavelength of radiation generally for the photosynthesis we get maximum photosynthesis in blue and red violet blue and red these are the wavelength areas which are efficiently are you know absorbed by the pigments and thereby that will be converted into chemical energy now uh, you will be surprised you know green green is not at all utilized by the green pigment that is chlorophyll now this you know light intensity you know if the light if the intensity of the light increases what happens it increases the temperature of course the plants or the pigments have ability to face certain intensity of light but if the light intensity increases uh, the pigments they get photo oxidated they look they become denaturated they lose their ability to convert this light energy into chemical energy so the quality of the light the intensity of the light and the quality of the light you know the quality means here pigments are able to absorb this light from 400 to 750 nanometers of the light this is photosynthetically very active 
actual radiation. Below 400 and beyond 750, these are not at all useful for the green plants. Of course, there are certain bacteria which are even efficient in absorbing the light, which is even less than 400 nanometers. But mostly, all green plants, all our crop plants, they're effective in utilizing the wavelength from 400 to 750 nanometers. This is quality of the light. Then coming to the duration of the light. So not only intensity, not only the quality, even duration of the light also matters. Based on the duration, crops are divided into, you know, certain crops require longer duration of light. Certain crops, uh, you know, perform well in, uh, you know, less, num less amount of light and more amount of dark. And some are, they do not uh, get influenced by the duration of the light. So if a given plant requires more than nine hours of light, generally we call them as long day plants. The plants that require roughly less than 900, they are known as short day plants. Day neutral plants, they do not get affected by duration of the light. So long day plants, short day plants, and day neutral plants. See, for example, uh, your sugar beet, beetroot, spinach, radish, these are long day plants, example. Your tobacco is there. Of course, xanthium is there, chrysanthemum. These are short day plants. And uh, your maize, cucumber, they are what we call day neutral plants. Now coming to the temperature, of course, temperature is also very, very important the climatic factor that influence your you know, crop yield. Now, generally we measure temperature uh, in the form of what we call, you know, centigrade and Fahrenheit, roughly, you know, 37 degrees of room temperature, you know, or our human body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade, which is equivalent to 98.5 Fahrenheit. Now there is a table, you know, to convert foreign heat into, you know, centigrade and centigrade into foreign heat. We have what we call thermometer that measures the temperature. Now, what is the effect of, you know, temperature? See, uh, effect of temperature is there. Now, uh, temperature uh, influences seed germination, seed growth, crop yield, etc., are influenced by the day temperature. So uh, temperature is uh, very, very influential. See, there are certain, uh, see, you know, if the uh, weather is very cold, now plants cannot do well. Seed germination gets affected, photosynthetic, uh, yield gets affected because if the temperature is low, the enzymes become rather inactive. They cannot perform at their optimum level. If the temperature falls below, you know, four or five degrees centigrade, or it is zero degrees centigrade, it causes what we call chilling injury because the water that is present in the cell, it gets crystallized. It damages the cell. So not only this, even now, uh, this uh, temperature also uh, influences what we call the, the activity of the microbes that are present in the soil. Now wind, wind is also very, very, another very, very important factor uh, that influences your crop yield. Now generally, uh, you know, a wind movement is uh, um, uh, influenced by the temperature and the pressure. Temperature and pressure influences the wind movement. The gentle wind, if the wind is very gentle, of course, that is very ideal for the photosynthetic or photo photosynthetic. If it is silent, it doesn't matter. But if there's a gust of wind, if the wind blows very you know, heavily, that causes damage. That leads to what we call a lodging. The mature crops. If a crop is ready for harvest, you know, if there's a gust of wind, it damages. It leads to lodging. It leads to breaking. It leads to uprooting of the foliage. 
so as you know uh, there is uh, uh, on high storied buildings you will see here and there or on the weather stations you can see what we call uh, wind direction will be shown by what we call there is an instrument what we call wind vane wind vane is the instrument that tells you which direction the wind is blowing of course the speed of the wind or the velocity of the wind is measured by an instrument uh, called what we call anemometer now the effect of wind you know um, a wind i told you very beneficial very gentle it it helps it increases photosynthesis exchange of gases takes place and uh, it helps in the pollination it helps in the pollination it helps in the drying of the soil and wind can be used for remove or for separation of choppy and filled seeds for cleaning of the harvested material we use wind then of course humidity is there uh, the relative the humidity is uh, uh, you know if it is a dry that is good if it is a highly humid conditions these highly humid conditions of course they they bring down the transpiration but you know they enhance the um, you know infections infections uh, they the you know infection rate gets accelerated disease sp spread very fast humidity then <laughs> of course um, you know rainfall this is very very important rainfall is very very important you know um, um, you know in india even today even after 75 years of independence now here in india only uh, we could achieve what we call um, you know irrigation facilities only for 40% of the cultivable land still you know more than 60% of the land cultivable land in india is depends on rainfall so rainfall is very very important factor for the uh, you know crop production you know now in examination point of view you know uh, generally they will ask you types of rains types of rains you know generally uh, three types of rains generally uh, we experience what we call rain due to what we call convection rain due to cyclones and rain due to what we call mountain barriers now rain due to convection means you know uh, when when sunlight you know hits the sea you know earth surface of course um, it gets hot up and uh, the air uh, even uh, the temperature of the air, you know air of the wind gets hot up and the it becomes lighter and it moves up as uh, the moisture laden air current moves up after going certain height the temperature falls down there it becomes cool under cool conditions so whatever the small little drops of rain that are present in the you know air they coalesce they they, they mix they get attracted with each other they fuse with each other small rain drops droplets fuse and of course it becomes big uh, every is 0.25 mm or more that air is incapable of holding that so that beaker which is more than 0.2 mm size you know it comes down in the form of rain drop so this type of rain what we call uh, rain due to convection that rain due to cyclones you know uh, you know cyclones is the pressure you know always moves from higher to lower wind also blows from higher to lower so uh, at times the you know the, in under different winds of different velocities uh, uh with uh, different temperatures and uh, um, low and high pressures we call depression 
low pressure areas and these low pressure areas uh, under these conditions you know the moisture laden winds suddenly move up with the high speed that what we call a cyclonic this cyclonic wind it moves up and uh, with great force it moves and uh, under its influence rain comes that rain what we call uh, rain due to cyclones so under low pressure areas under low pressure areas these cyclonic winds are created and they take water or uh, moisture laden air upwards with great force and that brings you know rain and such rains due to cyclonic depression are called cyclonic rains and the last one is what is called uh, mountain barriers you know uh, we in india we get uh, rains due to this uh, mountain bed see on the north of india we have high range of mountains aravalli mountains are there your himalayas are there so when the wind moves from you know south to north now these high ranges they obstruct wind movement so under that conditions wind stops it cannot move further and this you know be, you know uh, there they they um, you know there uh, the temperature falls and uh, uh, the moisture in the atmosphere comes down in the form of uh, rains so the rain that is because of the barriers of mountains are known as uh, uh, you know rain due to mountain barriers so three types of rains generally rain due to convection rain due to cyclones rain due to mountain barriers now you know whenever there is a rainfall you know generally in weather condition they'll tell so today there was a 5 mm or 5 cm of rain a 10 cm of rain cloud burst was there so the rainfall is measured by an instrument called rain gauge or rain gauge is an instrument that helps you to measure the quantity of the uh, you know rain received by a particular area now rainfall you know it affects it has tremendous effect you know if rainfall is less generally vegetation will be less if rainfall is less temperature will be higher if no rainfall soils are barren vegetation will be very less temperatures will be very high they are not cultivable those arid conditions semi arid conditions are not good for cultivation so effect of rain on crop you know it has a tremendous effect rainfall influences a lot not only it influences crop yield but also the vegetation you know now if no rainfall no vegetation no crops that ultimately leads to increase in temperature dry conditions droughts so uh, now if areas where there is a lot of rainfall generally the soils are good for cultivation the vegetation will be more the rainfall will be more and uh, even flora and fauna will be more more biodiversity will be there if rainfall high rainfall areas that is on either side of the equator you find luxuriant growth of vegetation your evergreen forests are there if you go to drier areas such as our uh, gujarat rajasthan areas where the rainfall jaisalmer area where rainfall is very very scanty in those areas you don't get you don't see any vegetation as only you will see sand dunes so rainfall has a tremendous effect tre tremendous influence on the flora and fauna of a particular area so this is uh, about uh, the meteorology then uh, after this uh, then we'll move to what we call soils soils now you know uh, uh, what is soil soil is nothing but 
the top top layer of your earth is nothing but the soil the mineral rich the mineral rich which has the inherent capacity to enhance the growth of plants is a fertile soil so it is the a medium the soil is the medium where plant growth takes place of course nowadays soilless culture hydroponics if no soil even plants are being or crops are being grown in in bottles in troughs where water is there the minerals are added and of course there uh, you can grow your uh, you know tomatoes your brinjals etc can be grown in waterless conditions or hydroponics so generally soil is the medium where plant growth takes place now uh, of course soil is formed from rocks parental rocks there are big rocks say if you remove top soil if you go a bit deep what do you find you find big rocks they are known as parental rocks now uh, rocks are of course rock formations rocks are primarily of three types of course igneous igneous rocks sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks now these all these three types of rocks you know they are subjected to extreme weather conditions maybe 50 degrees centigrade in may in uh, october november in december january the temperature will be you know 0 4 for single digit two extremes and in between these two they if there are rains and because of these extreme climatic conditions the big rocks or the parental rocks undergo what we call weathering this weathering is nothing but breakage see for example take a small rock you know pebble or a small stone put it in fire take it out when it's hot put some water over it what happens you will see it breaks so also in nature nature this is happening these you know summer winter rainy season these are there year after year this is going on because of some some years there are extreme hot extreme cold lot of rain no rain under such conditions the parental rocks they get subjected to these extreme weather conditions in due course they break this breakage is what we call weathering now these big rock small rock small still smaller ultimately leads to what we call soil particles that's how soil is formed now you will be amazed to know that for the formation of even one you know inch of soil it takes 400 to 1000 years soil is the most precious thing that is present on this globe it is costlier than your gold or platinum because it has the inherent capacity to produce so soil is the most precious thing now these soils you know soils for example uh, for our convenient we we can divide soils into you know maybe your sandy soils your clay soils your silt soils your loamy soils your chalka soils your black cotton soils regards so like this soils are classified variously primarily there are three, three major main types of soils one is sandy soil the other is silt soil or alluvial soil the third is what we call clay soil or black cotton soil if these three are roughly in equal proportion that soil we call loamy soil loamy soils are more and more precious soils very important soils most important soil type is your loamy soil which has 
sand, silt, and clay in equal, roughly in equal proportion. Now, this sandy soil, suppose, where do you find these sandy soils? Generally, sandy soils are present in the coastal areas. In the coastal areas, if you go to coastal regions, you will find sands. Or in other areas, if you go to Rajasthan and uh, western part of India, you will find sand. So, areas where the soil is filled with what we call sand, such soils are known as sandy soils. Of course, the sandy soils are not at all good for crop production. Though only they support only certain type of uh, uh, you know plantations. Say, for example, in areas. Uh, you can cultivate rice, tobacco, and mostly casuarina like Swargudung casuarina. They can be grown. But deltoic soils or alluvial soils, these are present in the deltoic regions of big rivers. Your Gangetic, your uh, Kaveri, the Godavari, and the Krishna deltoic areas, where the silt is there, very rich soils. In those uh, you know, alluvial soils, they are very rich. You can grow all types of crops. You can grow your cereals. You can grow your cash crops. You can grow your sugarcane, banana, chilies, vegetables, whatnot. Alluvial soils, your gangetic plain. See, you will be surprised to know that most of the habitations, large density of populations reside in deltaic areas. Deltaic areas of your Ganges. Say Uttar Pradesh, your Punjab, at Bengal. Lot of density of the population. Even in Kaveri, even in Krishna, and even Godavari. If you go to East and West Godavaris, deltaic soils, very rich. Lot of crops, lot of habitation. Lots of people live there. Okay. Now, uh, the other is what we call uh, the... Uh, black cotton soils, of course, cotton soils, the black soils are regards. Regards are black cotton soils, black soils are present in parts of sea. For example, if you take uh, Adilabad, Nizambad, Varangal, Kamam areas, and in Rayal Sima, of course, Karnul, Kadapa, Chitur, some of the areas, you find what we call these black soils. Black soils are very good, and uh, uh, there you can grow, grow what we call cotton, tobacco, groundnut, even. Uh, Jowar, Bajra can be grown. Sugarcane, rice can be grown. Black cotton soils, very deep. They have the ability to retain moisture. Sticky, clayey. And uh, they are very good for cotton. So that's why they are known as black cotton soils. See, black cotton soils are present in Guntur and uh, uh, even Prakasham, Kadapa and Karnul areas. In Telangana, we, you find uh, these black cotton soils. Nizamabad, Adilabad, Varangal. Mahbubnagar and uh, Khammam areas. The name itself tells you black cotton soils. They help in or in black cotton soils, you can raise your cotton in a profitable way. And of course, uh, there are certain inferior quality soils, what we call red sandy soils or Dubba soils or Chelka soils. In parts of, you know, Prakasham, in parts of Mahabur Nagar and Rangaridi areas, uh, there you find uh, they are not uh, that fertile. They are very shallow, uh, maybe 20 to 60 centimeters, and their water holding capacity is very less, and uh, drier kind of drought conditions are there. So when rains are there, generally people go, or uh, farmers go, take up what called Jowar, Bajra, Red Gram, Castor, Groundnut, etc. They are what we call red sandy or dubba and uh, chelka soils. Now uh, we have what we call problematic soils. Problematic soils are the, uh, see, some soils, some areas, they are very eroded. That is, if there are rains, you know, it removes topsoil. You will see only uh, barren rocks, do not support any plant growth. And uh, if, uh, it leads to what we call ravines, it will uh, steepy conditions. Landslides will be there. If you go to Himachal area, there are a lot of landslides. If you go to even um, Tirupati areas, landslides will be there. In the landslides, you know, um, uh, big rocks along with the soil, they move downwards. 
So in those areas, the, the, that areas get exposed. Only you will see rocky terrain. It will not support any plant growth. So eroded soils, ravine soils, and steepy slopes, steepy slope. There you cannot undertake cultivation. And uh, the other problematic areas are acidic soils and saline and basic soils. Generally, in areas where there is a lot of rainfall, you know, there, if rainfall is more, if there is a flooded condition, they get percolated deep into their act. So with the leaching of calcium, magnesium, potassium, etc., the deeper layers, the soil becomes acidic. That is pH less than 7. Maybe 6, uh, six or point, uh, 5. Such soils are known as acidic soils. So acidic soils are not good for cultivation of all. Of course, even in acidic conditions, you can grow certain crops such as rice. Or you can undertake what we call tea gardens, etc. Now, uh, in this is acidic soils. If soil is acidic, what to do? Because there is a leaching of important calcium, potassium, magnesium, etc. Leaching. So what do you do? You have to add these, these that is by adding, by adding limestone, by adding limestone either in the form of powder or uh, you know, limestone or burnt limestone or hydrated limestone can be added and thereby you can reclaim soils. You can reclaim acid soil. So the other thing is uh, basic soils. Now, if the soils are basic or saline, then uh, the pH will be more than, more than 7. Those are also not good for cultivation of all types of crops. Of course, there are only certain crops certain arid crops like your, um, say, for example, your castor, you can grow bajra, etc. Of course, uh, uh, certain uh, jowars, etc. can be grown, but you cannot grow. Even to certain extent, you can also grow what we call groundnut. So you can reclaim these alkaline saline soils by adding what we call gypsum. By adding gypsum and uh, uh, using plows and uh, blade harrows, etc., you can reclaim. Reclaim is nothing but converting back to neutrality. By adding uh, this gypsum, you can reclaim these uh, basic soils into normal soils. So, uh, these acidic soils and basic soils can be converted, can be reclaimed by adding certain materials. And thereby, you can you know, convert them into normal soils and you can uh, go for cultivation. Now then, uh, the uh, soil fertility and soil productivity, so the inherent capacity of the uh, soil is what we call soil fertility and the productivity is the ability of the soil to produce. That is, not only your uh, the fertility of the soil, but other conditions do matter in the productivity. What are the other conditions? The rainfall, the irrigation facilities, and uh, your plant protection mechanism, and uh, uh, the types of uh, 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 cultivation methods you adopt also determine your crop yield. That is, your even weather conditions, weather also. Say, for example, if there are a lot of rains, if there, there could be no rain, more rains or no rains. If there is an infestation of uh, your pests and uh, um, that, then what you have to do? You, you, you go for plant protection mechanism. So not only the fertility, but even other things do matter uh, in determining the soil productivity. So water supply, the climatic conditions and the cultivation practices. Cultivation, say, for example, if you go on uh, raising same crop, naturally your productivity falls. Instead of that, what you have to do? You have to go for what we call crop rotation, laying. If you do 
such practices your crop productivity gets enhanced now last is you know why why soil fertility is lost means because of intense cultivation because of uh, intense growth of your weeds and the leaching of uh, your um, you know important minerals deep into the soil and erosion and volatilization these are some of the things you know that leads to uh, the uh, loss of soil fertility then how can you manage the soil fertility the two important ways that is by adding organic and inorganic materials into the soil the organic would be your what we call uh, the uh, you know uh, bulky manures and concentrated organic manures bulky manures means your compost your farmed manure your bone meal your night soil your ashes etc generally this is the practices that are undertaken by farmers in summer generally you know they lift they transport the farmed manure from the pits into their fields or uh, what we call uh, uh, from uh, the poultry farms from the dairy farms they take this excreta urine excreta uh, the you know leftover fodder etc they either they are heaped or they are uh, put in the pit and of course in due course it gets converted into what we call a manure that will be added to the soil then in addition to this even there are certain things you know for example oil cakes or bone meal or blood and other uh, material that you get from the slaughter houses they can be used and added to the soil thereby you can add to the fertility of the soil of course on nowadays we have you know fertilizers are there we will stay will study about that then bio fertilizers are also there so organic inorganic and bio fertilizers by adding them you can enhance the soil fertility of the soil they can thereby you can get high productivity of course loss of soil or loss of the top soil is called what we call soil erosion it could be caused by if it is by wind we call wind erosion if it is by uh, you know uh, rain we call a uh, rain erosion or water erosion and this water erosion could be sheet erosion rill erosion gully erosion ravines etc etc are there and in some cases on the banks of the rivers or in the seashore areas wave erosion is also there now how can you you know uh, conservation of soil that is a uh, reduction of this erosion by mechanical means or by agronomical and by forestry methods mechanical means see for example if there are ravines if uh, there are uh, uh, river erosion or rill erosion gully erosion there are the steep areas are there in that areas what what do you do you construct certain bunds you you go for plantation a uh, wind checking plantations etc by constructing bunds thereby what you are doing you are slowing down the movement of the water thereby you can retain the silt and you will allow only the water to pass so here water instead of running you you may you make the water to walk rather than run so uh, by mechanical means by agronomic means by strip by uh, cultivate you know by plowing against uh, the slope uh, by going for what we call uh, strip cultivation wherein you 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 cultivate uh, certain crops which are spreading uh, that uh, they retain or they bear the rain drops and the other jowar your maize they allow this so both in strip areas some areas you you um raise crops that check erosion in in small parts you plant uh, the crops that allow for the easy movement and of course forestry is there by uh, cultivating big trees and uh, on the hedges etc you can check wind erosion now we move to what we call uh, the uh, third one is what we call 
manures and fertilizers. Manures and fertilizers. Of course, while well discussing uh, the soil fertility, I told you. Now, these manures and fertilizers. Here, manures means uh, the organic, organic manures and inorganic manures and uh, uh, biofit. So they can be primarily classified into three categories: organic fertilizers, inorganic fertilizers, and biofertilizers. What are organic? Organic means something related to your uh, living. That is here organic means your compost, your farmed manure, your oil cakes, your bone meal, etc. Or your night soil or in the uh, town areas, sewage and sludge. All these are collected and they are added to the soil. They enhance the richness of the soil. Here, not only the minerals are available for the, but even the soil texture, the water retaining capacity, the, the porosity, the plasticity of the soil gets altered. Thereby, it enhances crop production. So here we have organic fertilizers. They could be bulky. Bulky means here, format manure, compost, sewage and sludge, etc. Then uh, your organic could be growing what we call green manures. That is like your pili pesara or janumo, etc. You grow on large scale and when they uh, grow for up to half a meter or so, then you plow, you bury them into the soil. You see that it gets, it get, it gets uh, uh, incorporated into the soil. It gets uh, uh, composted. It, uh, so various microorganisms act upon them and uh, they convert that so that it gets incorporated to the soil. Thereby, it adds to the fertility of the soil. Then, of course, inorganic fertilizers are nothing but you are chemical fertilizers. Inorganic fertilizers are chemical fertilizers. Of course, you know, our green revolution, green revolution was because of mainly four or five important parameters. One was what we call um, your fertilizers, that is inorganic fertilizers, irrigation, plant protection was there, high yielding varieties were there, your marketing facilities. All these put together added to enhanced productivity that what we call, uh, you know, green revolution. Now, this green revolution uh, is because of what we call chemical fertilizer. These chemical fertilizers, are, they're produced in factories. And now based on that, you know, based on the chemistry, it could be a nitrogen fertilizer, it could be a phosphatic fertilizer, it could be a potassium fertilizer, and there could be another category, what we call, uh, you know, compo, or what we call compo, complex, complex fertilizer, for example, DAP, diammonium phosphate, not only one, if only nitrogen fertilizer has, nitrogen as the main constituent, phosphatic fertilizer, Phosphate rich, potassium fertilizer, potassium is rich. If all are present in a, a given proportion, that we call a complex. Good example for that is your diammonium phosphate. So these are all chemical fertilizers. These are chemical fertilizers. So organic, your format manure is there, farm compost is there, and this is produced by the heat method or trench method, your town compost is there. Of course, uh, sewage and sludge is there. I already told you, your uh, uh, night soil or podrity is there. And uh, green manus, of course, I told you, sun hemp is there, susbenia is there, pilipestra, fasciola, strilobis. All these are grown and incorporated to the soil. And uh, thereby, they, 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 they convert the soil, you know, it adds organic matter into the soil. It improves the soil texture. It also improves water holding capacity. It also adds to the porosity of the soil. And also it helps in the growth of microorganisms. Microbial activity also gets enhanced. Now, uh, this, I told you, uh, the bulk concentrated material, oil cakes are there, bone meal is there, fish mat, corn uh, and bone meal is there, bone meal, etc. are there. They are powdered and incorporated into the soil. So whatever uh, the material, waste material that is present in these slaughterhouses, they are brought, they are incorporated, they are powdered, they are dried and powdered, added to the soil. And of course, uh, already I told you, 
nitrogen nitrate fertilizers are there ammonium fertilizers are there and, uh, and nitrate ammonium fertilizers are there good number of fertilizers are there phosphatic fertilizers are there rock phosphate is there super phosphate is there basic sludge bone meal is there and potassium fertilizers muriate of potassium is there sulfate of potassium is there based on the chemistry of the chemical fertilizer they are nitrogenous fertilizer phosphatic fertilizers and potassium fertilizers other is of course i told you complex uh, that is diammonium phosphate is there then the other most important thing uh, is your bio fertilizers use of biological organisms to enhance the soil fertility to enhance soil fertility is what we call bio fertilizers now use of microorganisms you 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 see that these microorganisms are grown in the soil now what are these micro what how do they help in enhancing the soil fertility there are certain microorganisms which have, which have the ability to convert atmospheric nitrogen gaseous nitrogen at first in they convert it into nitrate form thereby add to the fertility of the soil such microorganisms are called as bio fertilizers and these bio fertilizers of course uh, they are symbiotic asymbiotic and free living see symbiotic means two organisms living together for mutual benefit a good example for this is your rhizobium azospirillum your uh, these are symbiotic associate asymbiotic azotobacter is there asymbiotic then free living mostly cyanobacteria or blue green algae they are grown on large scale and uh, uh, these cyanobacteria or blue green algae like uh, your nasca canabina alocera cyanobacteria and acylatoria formidium these are some of the blue green algae that have the capacity they have what we call nitrogenous enzyme that converts your atmospheric nitrogen into nitrate form and that will be liberated into the soil thereby enhancing the soil fertility as these microorganisms are used in enhancing the soil fertility that's why we call them as bio fertilizers okay and even uh, nowadays they are uh, the they are uh, they are being marketed they are available in the uh, market farmer can go and uh, buy them and inoculate them into his field thereby uh, their population gets increased and thereby they increase the fertility of the soil see for example nitrogen is available which is rich in uh, rhizobium azotobacterin is available in the market Uh, in the form of azotobacter there uh, the microorganism is azotobacter and uh, phosphobacter is there where bacillus negatum is there and these uh, they uh, enhance uh, the phosphate availability nitrogen availability thereby all the essential nutrients or the major essential nutrients the, such as npk which are uh, macronutrients if they are available in adequate quantity in a in a in a correct time generally you you get better yield crop productivity gets enhanced so this is about what we call a manures fertilizers and manures so so in today's uh, class we learned learned about what we call what is agri uh, agriculture methodology and what are different soils and what are manures and fertilizers now uh, uh, now if you have uh, i know uh, any doubt a uh, few minutes for uh, your doubts if you have any doubt you can uh, you can ask me uh, i'll try to clear your doubt if uh, of course if there are no doubts uh, generally of course tomorrow we have another class in tomorrow's class we will discuss about uh, agricultural practices such as what is tilth and tillage and what are weeds and uh, what are the various methods of weed control we'll also learn about uh, various cap cropping patterns what are the different cropping patterns and what are the different cropping systems uh, that are under practice now okay any doubt if you don't have any doubt now 
I'll call it a day and hope to meet you tomorrow.